Okay, without further delay, Tommy Abicola Mecca. happening 35, 40 years ago, uh, a lot of people were being evicted, especially the Mission, the Castro, the Hate, a lot of uh, those neighborhoods were really being hit hard. So this song comes out of that struggle. It's called Homes Not Jails. It's basically my philosophy of what we, about what we should be doing right now. We should be building housing, not jails. Because the reality is that in this culture, jails have become housing for poor people. And that's the reality of what has happened. And so we need to tear down the jails. Okay, so this is called Homes Not Jails. We got the line up, a single one finally got off the streets. Raising two little kids in a nice little flat just couldn't be me. Nice little job in a nice little firm she couldn't believe. The day it arrived, the letter from Bodie said she gotta leave. Give us homes, not jails. Give us food, not war. Take the land from the rich, give it to the poor. 
Well, he remembers the good old days. Parties on Castro's, demos on weekends, such wild, wild ways. Now he's got his surviving okay since the cocktail debut. Letter from Olga leaves him wondering what to do. She was living oh so very far away In a relative's flat She and her cat could live
All around. 
takes a lot and and when we when 35 years ago when we were evicted I along with them it destroyed our home it destroyed our family and it was it destroyed our community And I, you cannot imagine the horror that night. And many people have spoken about it tonight. 35 years ago, with thousands of people out here fighting, and people inside fighting, not just because it was a home, but there was, there was a sim something very symbolic about the fighting of the poor people against against the, the capitalists, the big money that owns this land. And I, I say this to you because so much of that is something that we remember. It's sort of a way that we kind of reminisce and we commemorate. But I have to tell you that there's a whole other side to that. And that is nine years before, there was a lot of good things that happened. A lot of great things happened. I mean, there are there things so revolutionary that I also feel it's important for me to give you the good news, and not just the news of the night of August 4th, because the August 4th was just a culmination of all the good things that were happening up to that point. Let me share with you that the Iron Tail struggle, we fought, we did everything. We did, we never let any stone go unturned in terms of our fight, because we were a non-violent movement. I mean, the, the whole thing about the civil rights movement that taught us is that non-violence is the only civil disobedience, those things work. And we used that. We went to the courts as well. We went through that process. We, we went through that all the way to the max, Supreme Court twice, to, to get the stay, to be able to, to get the appeals through. So don't think that we were just, August 4th was just something that, you know, happened, you know, eight, nine years after it started. But I will say there's a contrast. When you have a nonviolent civil rights movement meet face to face with uh, 
brutality and physical violence, that's what their solution is to trying to stop us. And so you have to understand that nine years is nine years of so many wonderful things that happened. And I'm just going to name a few. When I say the I Hotel Block, the I Hotel Block by the people across the street, those who never read to a Kurdish youth workshop, or a, Chi I mean, a Chinese Progressive Association, or a, a Asian Community Center, uh, those people, they didn't want people who were on the left or progressive. The, the reactionaries on the other side of Kearney Street didn't want that. They called this the Red Block. Why? Because we were a red building. Red brick building. So we're kind of proud of that. I always feel very proud of that. But look at Kearney Street Workshop. There was never a time, and I'm, I'm going to go through, let me just honor my commercial tenants because they were tenants as well as the upstairs tenants. And you have to understand, they did a, they did a, a tremendous job, our commercial tenants. When I think of Kearney Street Workshop, I think of a new art form, something that was totally new that no one really fully understood, yet it was the workshop artists, the writers, the photographers, you know, it was the uh, the musicians, the dancers, all that evolved out of Kearney Street Workshop, taking people from this community and elsewhere, developing and cultivating something so new and so revolutionary, and yet it spread to other parts of the of the other of the country, where people began to see art differently. Asian Community Center, Chinese Progressive Association had community centers. And they did something so significant. They were able to bring, this was, I think, where we got most of our, our base, our strength, because so many people came downstairs in order to see films about China. But remember, Nixon had never gone to China yet, and so many people had been so separated from their families that they were longing for that connection. Those organizations did a lot to build our strength and our, our base here in community. Kalayan Newspaper was really an organization that put out a, a national newspaper about the Philippines, about Filipino Americans. It evolved slowly into an organization uh, that fought uh, the Marcos dictatorship and later the KDP. This organization became North, or North American in scope. It had its birth here in the International Hotel. So we had ways of building the movement for the International Hotel through other organizations. And I, and, I, and I really put that out to you, that this was such a very significant part of our movement, our struggle. Um, we have a big fight ahead of us. And I just say that we're always, keep, we're always moving forward because even though we got stopped that night, Look at our building here today. Yeah. This is a monument, a testimony to the people's power to be able to really get a new international hotel right on the same place. And you know what? It took really, it wasn't really a, a struggle that was on the back burner. It immediately caught fire when, when we, we started again in 1994. I, I want to pay even tribute to the mayor's uh, International Hotel Advisory Committee that kept this struggle going uh, when uh, right after the eviction. And it really, it was the community that was monitoring and watching this land and stopping the owner from doing something to it. But, so to get it back up in 2005, hey, do you ever see anything like this where you get, you get a building, <laughs> not, not only just a building, you get housing, affordable housing, Federally subsidized housing in the same way. In Chinatown, and I mean, hey, you know. So, you know, the power of the people, the, the movement, the fight for, for, uh, for affordable housing, it, it has always been there. And the power of it, I would tell it's just one part of helping to build and forge that struggle. And it's a reminder of us that it continues. 
the reason I, I but this is my last point. The South the Market, the West South the Market Community Plan has an environmental impact report. It's about it's about a phone book size, and it's about what's going to happen in the South the Market. When the dot com failed around the early 90s, there was already a devastation in the South the Market, North the Market, and a lot of companies sort of came and gone, but what was probably the most penetrating uh, effect was the displacement of the tenants who lived there. And that's really, if you want to know where the big fight is, you know, they're not, the big tech companies not opening up into Silicon Valley, they're coming to San Francisco. And where are they going to open their shops? They're going to open it in downtown and central city. And where is that, what's the land use? And who's going to live in those neighborhoods? High-end high high housing has been built there. That's the only housing that's really been built, and not that much affordable housing. So who's going to be able to live there? Who's going to be displaced and have to be moved? And who's going to have to make room for all that? Multi-billion dollar tech businesses. Unless it's stopped. And, this, and stop with you. I'm going to be in it. And I want you to join me. Because a lot of people live there who've lived there for generations. And they shouldn't have to leave. They shouldn't have to be in there. And the city, under this administration, unfortunately, is leading the way to make that happen. And we don't want it. So the power of the people, the power of the people, that fought for the Iron Belt, that got this building up, has got to be there again in order to be able to stop these high-end companies. I leave one last remark. There's an African proverb that, that if you want to go fast, if you want to move fast, you move alone. But if you want to move If you want to move long, move together. Thank you. Coming to us from FCC, FCC, Robin Rodriguez. for giving us a chance to talk about what's going on at the Filipino Community Center at the Excelsior, because the Excelsior really is probably the other Manila town in this city. Um, but actually, the work I do, the work I do at the Filipino Community Center is actually just what I do on the side, my day job. The folks that pay me is actually UC Davis, where I'm a professor of uh, Asian American Studies. And I start with that because I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the people who fought for this place. I huge, owe a huge debt of gratitude for the struggles around the I Hotel. On one hand, there would not be Asian American studies in campuses around this country had there not been these struggles for social justice, including the struggle for the I Hotel. folks who came before me, but personally, I have to say it was the film. It was the film of the fall of the I Hotel when I was an undergraduate in the 90s that really, really sparked the interest I had to become an Asian American scholar, to become a Filipino American scholar. Because the stories, the stories of the Manos, the stories of their life, lifetimes of exploitation just angered me. And the very idea that not only would they have to labor all of their lives and be exploited, but that they couldn't even retire and live the rest of their lives in dignity. It angered me. But even more, I was inspired by the fierce, fierce resistance of those very monos in their 
struggle to assert their right to live with dignity and respect. So for me, that film was the thing that said, I want to do that. I want to tell the stories of today's manas and manas. I want to tell the story of those who continue to struggle and work for this country. I want to be able to tell the stories and fight alongside them. So one of the things I start with in my class is I say, no history, no self. Right? A lot of folks here, college students, you've heard this before, yeah? yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you're listening. If you were in my class, I would not to check up. I don't ask them. No history, no self. It's an important thing for us to hold on to, this idea that we have to always hold on to history to get a sense of ourselves. But I think that if we look into the past without making the link to our present, right? To look into the past and to stay in the past without making the link into the present, it defeats the spirit of that idea of no history, no self. So it's really critical, especially now, especially now, especially with the work we're doing at the Filipino Community Center, that we need to see that so many of the struggles that Filipinos had in the past continue to this day. It hasn't ended. It hasn't ended. People continue to struggle working incredibly long hours under unbearable conditions. And we have manos and manas that we really need to be able to come together for right now. So I want to just be able to draw on the spirit of this space of resistance and to call on you to just hear Harold Butales' story. Because Harold represents one of the new manos, the manos of the 21st century, who are working and struggling and this time not struggling to be the families of America, but to take care of the families of America as a caregiver. He's gonna share his story, but also what he's gonna do is share and invite you to join with him and the rest of the Filipino caregivers who are really on the brink of organizing their own group to really stand up for themselves. So we're gonna look at that. Good evening, everyone. I cannot speak good English, but I'm trying to do my best so that I can speak good so that you guys can understand. Uh, I am a Filipino, and my name is Harold. Uh, I was born in the Philippines. I came here in this country last 2007. I was hired by white people, a white uh, company. Uh, which is based in Alabama. I was hired by my skill. I was a first-class wielder in the Philippines. And then, uh, they went to the Philippines and having a skill test. I, I am one of those lucky guys who, who passed the, the test. And we are all 68 Filipinos, first-class wielder, who, who had, uh, was hired at the time and work in Alabama. But before that, uh, I, was, I was hired in the Philippines and then the recruitment agency asked for the 16,000 US dollars cash, which is, it's really hard for us uh, workers to produce that kind of amount, which is really, really big. And then, you know, when, uh, $16,000 is not easy to produce in the Philippines. But as, as we really, really like to work here abroad, uh, we, we, they offered us, or the, once we, uh, we had a visa, because they're giving us its uh, 2 b visa, which is a uh, seasonal working visa. And then, they gave us uh, assistance for the lending company or they, ju they just gave us instruction that once you had a visa, show this visa to a lending company and they will provide you money. Which is, they give you 16,000 US dollars and the interest is 7.5.
which is really huge. Then we have that money, and then we give it to the recruitment agency. We don't have money to live for our families, our children. So we flew. So things happened. We we flew from Manila to to LA. That's our point of entry. But when we arrived in LA, the immigrations hold us because we have only 17 days more to go for our visa. The immigration said, what are you doing here guys? You have only 17 days more to go. And then I was a leader of that group so I, I was home by about 12 hours in LA and then I said, I arrived in LA at night so I said, we will, we're gonna call the company tomorrow because there's no office at this time, it's 9 o'clock in the evening. So, so that's the thing happened. When we arrived in Alabama the next day, we just uh, work for, uh, we just uh, having a skill test again, which is really hard. And then we work for about, for about two months, and then this, the company was gone. So it's really a big, if a big problem because Alabama had a few people, a Filipino people, which is uh, nobody can help us where to go, which way to go. So the 68 Filipinos having a big problem on that time. So I decided to move here uh, last 2009 here in San Francisco to find another job. I started to work as a caregiver, not in my skills. Not the thing that, get, that they hired me to work here and then the salary that they promised, still nothing. So we owed a lot, the Filipinos uh, who work here owed a lot of money and having trouble in the Philippines. And then I started work here in 2009 as a caregiver. I experienced different problems as a caregiver. They, uh, they, didn't, they promise you uh, uh, a food, which is, fr they said, a free accommodation and free food, but the food is not enough for the two person who work in the facility for a week. So you're gonna buy your own food, then they say that they give you accommodation. But we only sleep in the garage. Most of the caregivers sleep in the garage. There's no such accommodation that what he said. That's why you get only a $1,200, $1,200 in a month, in a month. And you work six days a week, six days a week, or I, in my account, I work more, almost 24 hours a day. So it's really hard. Uh, my experience is really hard. At this time, as what Robin said, that we are the new gener a man of generation. Yes, it is true. So, farther than that, Robin will tell you about the whole story. And I, before that, I would like to invite you guys to support our, our project. We're doing the Caregiver Research Project, uh, which is uh, headed by the Philippine Community Center. And we're doing this thing to change uh, to, to gather the story of all the caregivers and all the workers. So, thank you for listening to my story. Where we're trying to really document the stories of today's manos and manas, starting with the caregivers at the Filipino Community Center. We meet every Wednesday. Um, and so part of the project is it's called a Participatory Action Research Project. So basically, you take folks like me who got trained to do this stuff, to pass it on to the caregivers themselves so they can collect their own stories. And the point isn't just to tell a story. The point is to tell a story, collect it, get enough stories so people are inspired to come together and fight for something better. And so right now, Harold is one of a core set of 15 worker leaders who stepped up 
We have to head out, actually, because Karen Harold has to go to work at 11 o'clock. Um, we, you know, Harold has like three jobs, but he puts time aside to, to work on this project with us, and we could use every single bit of energy you guys have to be able to, again, tell these stories, collect these stories, tell these stories, and hopefully get momentum behind really um, fighting for something better for low-wage Filipino immigrant workers. So, Filipino Community Center, we're gonna meet up on Wednesday. Um, we always meet at 6.30. Um, there's always food, because that's how we like it. And again, thank you so much for giving us a chance to share the story. I call on Tim Dionat to the, uh, to the front. Uh, share with us a little bit about the Iron Tell. How are you doing, Tim? Thank you very much. I'm here representing uh, the International Hotel, Senior Housing Inc. I'm on the board of directors of the uh, entity that runs the building. And it's not very glamorous. We have board meetings, we deal with insurance, pipes, and plumbing, and transfers, and compliance issues, and defense. But all of that is really necessary to keep this place in compliance, keep it safe, and keep it uh, eligible for continued federal funding. So we do, we do behind the scenes, we make sure that this place survives, and this place uh, continues to serve the community. Uh, when I was asked to be on the board, it meant a lot to me because I actually used to hang out at the I Hotel when I was in high school. There was a karate studio in the basement, and I took karate there. And um, there was also a barber shop, Tina's Barber, where my dad used to bring me for haircuts. So I had a connection. I used to uh, do Christmas shows here when the hotel was here, dance and the Filipino dance and music. Every Christmas and throughout the year, we would do that as a college student. So fast forward uh, 30 years, and it's really been an honor and a privilege for me to be on the board that runs and operates this building. And I just want you to know that we're supportive of the programs that we do here, and anything you need, just feel free to, to uh, help on. So on behalf of the board of directors of ISHI, we wish you a great celebration. Thank you. Any more lunch on No? Still. Okay. Uh, you know what we're going to do? We were going to have a, uh, a memorial to the late Jeff Tagami who just passed away. It's a video, a video memorial to Jeff that we're going to have. A, we'll have we'll, we'll, that will be followed by, uh, by, uh, by Phil. But we're going to have uh, it's a video poem that Jeff Tagami did. Uh, it's a video poem uh, by the late Jeff Tagami, Watsonville poet, um, who recently passed away. Monterey County. And in between there, that area, you should know, 
That's the breadbasket of America, from the agricultural business to the industrial, and now we have here in San Francisco the computer age. Agriculture was because we had workers, we had land, we had fertile land. Everything you've eaten thus far in your life, Del Monte Foods, Pillsbury, Smuckers, the Jolly Green Giant, was produced right there in Pajaro and uh, Salinas Valley. You can see today, 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 Driscoll strawberries, coastal berries, um, like I said, Green Giant, you go anywhere, Little Rock, Tallahassee, New York, you know, anywhere you go, Concord, New Hampshire, Seattle, Washington, wherever you go, you'll see that produce spinach from Salinas. And you should know that someone busted their, busted their ass to pick that, pick that spinach, pick that lettuce, and pick those strawberries. And I can attest to that because the reason why we have workers today doing the jobs that they do, whether it's in the hotel business, working the nonprofits, doing what they do is because we're trying to upraise and uproot the injustice of capitalism to make sure that we are dignified, we are living the life that we're here to live with our families for respect and also consideration to be treated just like anybody else. You need to donate to Manila to my brother. So, so what I'm saying is that my father came here in 1928. He came through Kearney Street and Monong Owl's poems when Al would talk about Exeter, he talked about Oxnard, he talked about Isleton, Salinas, Stockton, Castroville, Watsonville, and all the other towns that all the Monongs worked, even in Alaska. They came here. They came to the I Hotel Manila Town, which was 10 blocks wide to get information on jobs. When that boat's leaving to Alaska, what time do I need to be in Seattle? Well, who's hiring? When is that asparagus ready to pick in Stockton? When shall I go down to work the cantaloupe in, Ex in El Centro, for example? San Pedro, where do I need to go, who do I need to speak with? They would get information from Kearney Street to pass along and spread like wildfire to get jobs so they can send back home, so they can maintain a family, so they can maintain an existence, a meager existence at that. This is the place where they came to to get information. And on the eve of um, August 4th, 1977, there were 50 elder Chinese and Monangs who were here in Monangs and folks who had wanted to help save those elders. But long before that time, long before that time, from 1910 to 1930 to 1950 to 1960, there were hundreds, if not thousands, thousands of residents who came to the hotel to get a little reprieve, to get some respite, to get some information, to share some synagogue with their Kabbalahs, to see about how their families were doing back home, and once again, to maintain a culture, a livelihood, to persevere, to make sure that they were carried through, to maintain their fortitude, to get through the rest of the year, to make it through the picking fields of the lettuce season, going to Alaska to make sure that they were there to get aboard that ship so they could work like their, work their butts off, to work 20 hours a day, 18 hours a day, whatever the case may be, they were performing it, performing labor. And what everyone needs to understand, whether you're a musician, whether you're an activist, whether you're a student, whether you're a retired person, no matter what that the monongs have told us, the monongs have taught us, was that it takes hard work. It takes hard work to get something done. It takes hard work to get something accomplished. And I think that's what my father had always instituted in me, and my brother and my sister, that whatever you do in life, it's gonna take some hard work. So whether you face injustice or you don't, Make sure that you are geared with the mindset that nothing in here is for free. And if you want it that badly, just like the tenants wanted to have low-income housing, they worked hard for that. And we need to work hard in our community to cure all the injustices of capitalism, of social justice, to make sure that our people, your people, all of our people are taken care of. So with that said, I just want to say, hey, thank you for coming out to the Newtown. I really appreciate, I really appreciate um, everyone's efforts and commitment to the Manila Town Heritage Foundation, including our, our Vice President, Sylvia Bivar. Sylvia.
Tony will bless him first. And all of our Board of Advisory members. But you know, there's another lady too that should be in my speak later on. And she was the direct, Evelyn, yeah, Evelyn Little Pieces. She really loved it. But um, I'm excited to hear um, Miss Nancy Hong speak later on in the behalf of Trinity. Yeah. Nancy, we really appreciate her uh, being here and helping us keep this dream alive. And once again, it's my pleasure and my honor to have you here with us. Before you leave, folks, before you leave, um, I want you to do one thing for me, okay? Before you leave, do one thing for me. I want you to get up and stretch. Stretch your arms. Stretch your leg, you know, stretch oh, yeah. out, you know, roll your neck a little bit, roll your shoulders, put your hand up, put the other hand up, and kind of shake the leg, whatever you might need to do. But I want you to get this right hand here and reach around to your back pocket right here, grab your wallet. Put your wallet out, you know. It's kind of hard to get out, but you know, it's kind of thin, you know, but it's here. I want you to drop a dollar or two in that donation box because the food, the effort, the energy is because we love you to be here and support us. So because of you, the Hill Sayo, this is why we do it. So please, uh, thank you. I want to recognize some unsung heroes of the Manila Town Center. And that would be the audio and visual crew, the camera people, the sound people, the ones that don't make the highlight reel, but whose work does make the highlight reels of YouTube. So we'd like to thank you. I'd like to uh, thank uh, my man Matthew. Matthew. Um, Matthew's almost the saint. He's like Saint Matthew of audiovisual. <laughs> and I would like to introduce a uh, brother who is truly. Really, we come down to it. He's, he's the he's the heart of the I Hotel in many ways. The heart of the I Hotel, Mr. Phil Chavez. I'm gonna have this guy, uh, hey brother, accompany uh, uh, this uh, Dumbe. Uh, Middle Eastern uh, drum. Yeah, yeah. Let's get one my ukulele and my bow. We have uh, our, our players that came before. We have our. You guys want to put this in? We got a zero. We got a zero.
evictions because we were poor and we didn't have the money for rent. And in a capitalist system, if you don't have the money for rent, something is wrong with you. And you are criminalized for the sole act of being poor in America, KKK, theoretically of being poor and of color in this capitalist system. So I wrote a piece in honor of our ancestor of resistors, in honor of my mama Dean who transitioned March of 2006, and for without whom again there would be no me, in honor of all the elders who sit here and all our young folks who continue to keep on keeping on no matter what. Today you're witness, right? So this is in honor of, uh, of the I Hotel. I need a little bit of a beat from my brother Bill. But then I'm gonna expect some not so soft. Okay. Lenar, Dow, Shorenstein, and more. Where there's indigenous people's land, there will be developers trying to control. Under disguises, paper trails, and police codes. But before we go ahead, we must go back 519 years when the same rich white man called themselves discoverers, explorers, and conquistadors. Tell me how you want to discover something was already inhabited and it was never even yours. And then watch the story to take out the murder and the glory and turn it into 500 years of lies and glory living in your libraries as history. So please, let's push forward a new time of peace, love, and anti-war. Back to a time when the conquistadors renamed themselves as speculators, real estate agents, devil opers, and more, with names like Leland Stanford and Shorenstein. But stop! If you think the story is over, it's not. Let me introduce you to some revolutionaries named Al Robles, Emil de Gosman, Peter Yamamoto, Phil Storrow, and hundreds more who stood tall in the face of those 20th century conquistadors, saying no matter what, aquí estamos y no nos vamos, hell no we won't go. <laughs> In the house that resistance built, the I Hotel. In the house that resistance built, saying hell no to displacement, devil opers and gentrification tours. Sit, lie, stop and frisk, gang injunctions and the never ending war on the poor. No people, it isn't his story. We have a lot more writing and talk story from the Bayview, the Mission, Manila Town, and the Tenderloin. We have a lot more writing to do until it truly transforms from his story to talk story forever more. Yeah. to all come into a circle. Everybody, even all those folks just eating and chattering and making art and being fabulous. All y'all need to stand. Come on in. We're going to make a giant circle. First of all, none of this would happen without our ancestor revolutionaries.
Monte Claro. Joe and Fernanda Gonzalez. Lola Francesca Aldera Chavez. Vicente Pascual. Marco Tamayo. Lola Seferino Chavez. Elizabeth Monte Claro. Marquita Robles. Jeff Trinidad. Derek Fructoso. Gregory Feel free to leave a token 
uh, was mental. Um, if you want to write something, if you want to write a note with your thoughts on a piece of paper and put it on the altar, please feel free to do so. And, and to make well, all four ancestors, uh, specifically Uncle Al Robles, Uncle Bill Soro, Mama D, and my uh, grand abuelito, Francisco, happy. Bill Chavez is going to do somewhere over the My favorite song. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
listen. No that Here. Decide, decide, there. Now. Now, okay. Decide, decide, you decide. Be careful. You don't want them to get pain in the new clothes. See, because I got pain already on my face. Yeah, that's no, gonna come out. Yeah, well, I don't want to get on those type of things. You can buckle their shoes. Last week. Oh, last week. Yeah. Oh, that's um, Mom, trip. Trip. Why do you want it to trip? It's going to get dark. It's going to get better. Wow, that's a cool color. Oh, that's dark blue. Sorry, Dante. Now paint that on Daddy, what do you do if you want to change color? Alright, that's enough. Good time, but I want to make an announcement. It's time for a red alert. This evening, 35 years ago, 1977, during the evictions of the Iowa Hotel, the tenants were awaiting the arrival of the police and the sheriff's department, and they were getting uh, they were getting notices that uh, alerts that uh, people were coming from uh, law enforcement and, and uh, mounted patrol and uh, the. Uh, the special, uh, the special units, the special squad teams that were coming here to take the hotel. And we had the, uh, the residents and we had the supporters out in, uh, I guess there were about 2,000 that were uh, formed, they formed a human barricade. So right now we'd like to uh, get the red armbands. What they did was they wore red armbands. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, distribute the armbands. We'd like you to put those armbands um, on your arm. Or if you wanna put it around your head, that's fine. So, we have the armbands, we'll get the armbands, and we're going to give you an armband. So, if you need help with putting the armband on, we'll help you. If you can get it by yourself, by all means, please do. Oh, there they are, right there. Okay. Red for the blood. Red. I'm not going to get jumped on. Red army. <laughs> Enter at your risk. Enter this door at your risk. Enter right or left? Then you can rub my Oh, man. They say this the blood, not the crisp. Crisp. Well, I was told that Stanford University started the blood to the crib. Oh, really? Isn't that amazing? Really? Makes sense. Stanford. Stanford started the blood to the crib. Wow. They got it. It's so powerful, isn't it? Everywhere there are days, there's a major college there. Stanford, Harvard, everywhere they have it. Really? Really? In the reason why they all took the band is that. Wow. Isn't it amazing? Well, I, I, I should both. We're connected. <laughs> I'm half and half. I'm a. We're homo sapiens. We're homo sapiens. We're earthlings. Yeah. We're one nation. Ancient aliens. Ancient aliens. Can we use the toilet? God bless the queen. My happy birthday to Obama at, at 12 o'clock. His birthday be August the fourth. That's the day. Okay, so it's 12:02 right now. Does anybody have on their arm? Oh, it's 12:02. Okay, so Tony, can I use the toilet? Huh? Can I use the toilet first? Or you have to go yeah, yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, no problem. I got, uh, hey, I got a minute. <laughs> Everybody make an expression. What does this mean? All the score if we fought we need to get the gong. We voted. 35 years ago, International Hotel was here. What does this mean today? Occupy 
occupied America. You know, where are we at? 35 years ago, when they were building that pyramid building up there, they wanted to move this building out of here. So, thank God for spending that night. 35 years, they spent the whole night here. That's how this building was saved. And they pulled those down. Yeah. This is a the process I set up inside and outside of the hotel. Elder tenants express appreciation to supporters in the streets. 1.30 a.m. Supporters of the hotel side of Kearney are told to prepare for a practice formation of the human barricade. They are told to remove jewelry and anything that can be grabbed or torn off. Supporters who are not prepared to be arrested are asked to stand across the street. Those remaining are asked to face out forward the street and back up against the building. They link arms in rows six persons deep. 3 a.m. Announcement. Police have blocked off streets around Chinatown police and deputies approaching. Crowd has grown to 200 sports spilling into the sidewalks between Jackson and Washington streets. Squad cars start surrounding area, mounted police approaching. The human barricade is up again. Collective voices rise. No evictions. We won't move. Police have blocked up Columbus and Grant. Patrol cars and police are at Sansomi and Jackson and at Grant. Kearney is cordoned off at play on the other side of the Holiday Inn Bridge. The crowd is tense, sensing the confrontation that is developing. We won't move. 3.15 a.m., a hook and ladder fire engine turns onto Kearney, accompanied by 11 mounted police, 8 motorcycle police, and 10, 10 club building foot patrolmen. The ladder is to be used to storm the roof of the hotel. Supporters on the roof try to push the ladder away with police. A police loudspeaker on the Kearney Street Bridge warns the supporters on the roof that they will be arrested for interfering. 20 tactical squad police officers run up the ladder and seize the roof. 3.21 a.m. A caravan of police and sheriff's vehicles pull in front of the hotel, separating the crowd between the hotel and those on the opposite side of Kearney. 65 sheriff's deputies line up in the middle of the street. A phalanx of blue-helmeted tactical squad police close in from Washington and block the area between the hotel sidewalk and the police and sheriff's vehicles. In a narrow space, space between the vehicles and the observer's side of Kearney Street, 11 police on horseback charge the crowd and force them all the way up to Columbus Avenue. 3.30 a.m. 
Non-police sheriff's personnel on Kenya are the human barricade supporters and the 30 or so press people, legal observers, and freelance photographers. Sheriff Richard Hongisto holds the first of several press conferences. A team reporter asks, Sheriff, sure. what's the possibility for violence? Are you willing to face the consequences? Hongisto turns to the newsman, smiles, and says, of course. 3.42 a.m., the loudspeaker voice from the bridge announces, you are resisting the sheriff's lawful order. You are subject to arrest and removal. 3.45 a.m., officers in full riot gear, including tear gas canisters, surround the human barricade. From Washington to Jackson Street, the tax squad pushes, beats, and breaks apart the human barricade from the sides. We want it moon. 3.48 a.m. Mountain police engage in skirmishes in front of the hotel, using their prancing, awesome mounts to push the human barricade against the building wall. The police flail a whale at the defenseless, trapped people. Many of the first robbed the barricade suffered direct blows to the head and body, but through sheer determination, anger and bravery run back into formation despite their interest to hold the police away from the Eiffel entrance. In the street, horsemen chase supporters who resist their blows and pin, and pin them against vehicles, kicking and pummeling them with clubs. From the loudspeaker, quivering emotion choked voice screams, the people united will never be defeated, God damn it! Supporters push back to Columbus and constrain behind a barricade shop. The whole world is watching. It is true, radio and TV and press media are recording the attack on the human barricade. A policeman smashes a news camera mount Man's light with his wheelie, wheelie club before plunging into the hotel supporters with his club. As the flanks of the human barricade are dispersed from the Victory Building on the Washington Street side of the hotel, police climb up ladders to the fire escape, smash open windows, and enter the building. We won't be moved! 3.55 a.m. Police smash glass on sport storefronts between the Victory Building and first floor of the hotel. A sledgehammer is used on the door of the I-Hotel Tenant Association storefront. Police order the horsemen back and they line up in the street facing the remaining arm-locked supporters. 4 a.m. The smell of horse manure, horse shit, fills the cold night air. Police joke and laugh about the direct hits. There is a silence and calmness as the demonstrators pull themselves tighter together front of the hotel door. The sound of shattering glass permeates the air as police smash into the storefronts on the side of the hotel. We won't be moved! 4.06 a.m. Support leaders tell the human barricade to move toward Jackson Street. 4.10 a.m. The human barricade moves towards Jackson Street. The supporters on the other side of the police on Jackson link arms to form another human chain facing the police. Presenting this defensive line, the members of the human barricade are able to safely reach the other side of Jackson Street. We won't be moved! 4 11 a.m. The hotel's main entrance is unguarded. 4 13 a.m. The supporters are now contained behind the police barricade on the north side of Jackson and Kirby. Five tax squad officers line up on each side of the doorway to prevent demonstrators from retaking the entrance. 4.14 a.m. Sheriff Richard Hangisto, in turtleneck sweater and sport coat, in contrast to uniformed officers, strides to the doorway and peeks in between the cracks of the double door of the hotel. The doors are barricaded from the inside, so he enters through the side entrance of the IHTA storefront. Within minutes, the first of the supporters are carried out. We won't the first, move. The first four supporters began to reform, reform a line and chant, no evictions, we won't move. Under Sheriff Denman, who appears to be in command, asks police to move the chanters to Clay Street, where police have another barricade. The officers literally pounce on the chanting supporters, pinning their arms behind their backs and jerk them away. Denman screams, easy, easy, to control the overzealous police. 4.25 a.m. Police Chief Charles Gaines, Gaines, dressed in his three-star uniform, is surrounded by reporters. He is responding to reporters' questions. They should, they should have pushed them off to the side. 
They pushed them into the building and they had no place to go. The problem was in progress. I don't know what it was. I thought if the demonstrators saw the number of police, they would pull back. 4.36 a.m. Sledgehammers and crowbars have been used to force open the doors of the International Hotel. Access has been used to destroy the door of the Chinese Progressive Association at 8.50 Kearney. The appearance tried to break down the door of the Asian Community Center, 846 Kearney, but failed. Supporters cheered this defeat. We won't be moved! 4.43 a.m. The supporters inside the hotel announced over the loudspeaker that the sheriff's deputies have taken the second floor, but the first floor is still occupied by tenants' supporters. We won't be moved! 4.45 a.m. On the streets, a contingent of deputies walked it walks to the doorway of the Curtin Street workshop. The wooden planks protecting a glass window are unscrewed to reveal Curtin Street workshop's members calmly awaiting the arrival of the deputies. The KSW people meet the deputies at the door. Words are exchanged between the deputies and Jim Dog, who leads the deputies toward the back of the workshop. Apparently satisfied that there are no additional supporters hiding out in the back room, the KS people are escorted out into the street. Don tells the journal that all the photogenic equipment and supplies used for the community arts class are still inside. We've been running classes all the time, even today. Everything is in there. The sheriff said they would take no responsibility for the equipment. 4.52 a.m. The padlock on the second-hand store in the corner of Jackson and Kearney is broken open. 4.59 a.m. Around the corner, deputies begin smashing the Jackson Street Gallery mural and break down the gallery's door and all doorways that might lead to the hotel or storefronts. Some of the supporters begin to chant, See Heil! See Heil! The slow but steady eviction of the supporters inside the hotel continues. They are not being arrested, but are carried outside of the police barricade on Clay Street. We won't be moved! 5.20 a.m. The deputies cut the wires to the supporters' loudspeaker mounted on the corner of the building at Jackson and Kernan. 5.25 a.m. The first of the elderly tenants walks out, dazed, from the front, of the front door of the hotel. He stands there and shaken by the presence of so many police and media people taking his picture, begins to walk toward Jackson Street where the thousands of supporters are chanting behind the police barricade. A policeman stops him and directs him toward Clay Street. Another old man exits and is escorted by a younger supporter. She asks supporters, do you know where you're supposed to go? No one knows. A Filipino family soon follows, they glare at the deputies as they march out. 5.37 a.m. Felix Ison, 79 years old, walks out with the aid of two supporters. He tells reporters, I lose my voice, I am told to death, I can no longer take care of myself. One man is cursing as he's led away from the hotel. I want to go back to my home. Mr. Yip is 72 years old and he is, support he is sporting a Yippy power button on his coat lapel. Sheriff Hongisto is holding another impromptu news conference on the sidewalk in front of the hotel. He describes the eviction as absolutely nonviolent. We didn't knock down as many doors as we thought we might have had to. He asked about, he asked about injuries. Angisto replied, well, I did scratch my knuckle. We won't be moved! 6 a.m. Under Sheriff Denon calls for Dr. Richard Fine over his bullhorn. It seems one of the elderly men has been stricken with chest pain on the second floor. 6.10 a.m. Waha Tong Pao, a resident since 1961, walks out of the hotel. His jaw is set and there is anger in his eyes. We won't be moved! 6.14 a.m. Deputies are still trying to batter down the door to, uh, batter down the, door to the Asian Community Center. 6.30 a.m. Under Sheriff Denman walks up to the two private security guards hired by Four Seas Investment Company to guard the building after the evictions are completed. Denman tells the guard supervisor to call their employer and get more guards to patrol the site once the police leave. I'm afraid your men will be in danger, Denman comments.
645. Supporters on the other side of Jackson Street are told to rally at St. Mary Square. As the crowd begins to disperse, money turns warns that police have been harassing individuals leaving the area. People are instructed not to leave the siege area alone. As the morning breaks, the stench of horse manure fills the, el the already stagnant air. Once for curse the closet police officer. Kearney Street never smelled like this before. 6.50 a.m. The last of the supporters is taken down from the roof of the hotel. The sun is up. Around the Cordonoff Hotel battleground, people are starting to go to work. At Clay and Kearney, six police cars are lined up along Portsmouth Square Park. Pedestrians are stopped from walking up Clay Street. Kearney Street traffic is detoured at Sacramento Street. 7 a.m. Under Sheriff Devin allows the press to enter the hotel. Denman tells his force to be good to the media, indicating that the entire eviction has been a production by the entire police and sheriff put on, particularly for the media. Inside the hotel, windows and doors were smashed and tenants' rooms were destroyed. It is painful knowing that just hours ago the hotel was still occupied. Tenants' beds looked like they had just been slept in and the rooms still had personal belongings in them. Most of the tenants left empty-handed, leaving behind such valuables as television sets, stereos, and even personal family pic pictures. One tenant's electric alarm was still buzzing. The tenants were forced to leave their home, not knowing if they would ever see these possessions again. The destruction that occurred during the eviction was extensive, but, but, but the building was gone through similar incidents before, and the tenants had always made it livable again. We won't be moved this time. So those were uh, events uh, that happened on the night of the eviction. That was the timeline. So we want to honor uh, this space and honor the folks, not only not only the tenants, but the people that put themselves in harm's way, the people that locked arms, the people that formed the human barricade. Uh, Resisting capitalism, resisting the police, you know, resisting the uh, uh, the destruction of the Manila Town community, and us being here uh, is a testament to the will of the Manas and the Manas, the elders that uh, that were here and are still here. One of the things that happened that night was Wahat um, Tampao. He sliced cantaloupe for the tenants that were here because people were very very stressed knowing that the police were coming. So we're going to have Mauricio um, slice the cantaloupe, and we're going to take part and eat uh, of that cantaloupe in, in, in remembrance of Wahat and in remembrance of the, of the night of the eviction. Um, so again, thank you for being here. And Roy, where's that cantaloupe, brother? Let's get this great day. We won't be moved. Did you go to dinner? Happy yeah. birthday, Obama. You want to go to the Obama one? Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Who was it? Mauricio? Who was it? Wait, you got to film that. Yeah. Okay. And this is what Wahat Tapao did uh, on, this night, on, on, uh, on this night back in 1977. He used to try to calm everybody down. And it was part of his wisdom, you know, knowing that uh, you had to keep your head when, uh, when things all around you were, were happening. You know, people were in dangerous way. It was his way of, uh, of telling people, hey, you need, to, you need to relax too, you know. Because we know we know what's coming, we know what's happening. So. Okay, so we've cut the we cut the cantaloupe in half. So you're invited to cut to come and slice to slice pieces of the cantaloupe. Okay, I cut it in half. So everybody, cut it, cut a slice off. 
there's still some seeds in there that we need to scoop out. But, and we do have some sliced cantaloupe here. So. I think I'll go to this one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Do it. I'll do it. You want me like, if I figure, if I bleed, it's not my fault. I'll do that. It's only half bad. They stood here 35 years and made sure that that triangle building, the pyramid building, didn't overtake them. And we are still fighting today in San Francisco District 6 for equal housing rights since Pacific Heights and Jonestown. And in pursuit of happens, a lot of things are happening. San Francisco, we will only be a great country when we have everyone represented here. Our diversity must represent everyone. Thank you, International House, for standing up that night. Edmund Juicy. And happy birthday, Obama, August 4th, and my day at SBC. And God salute the Queen because she talks about the tree. In the land of the free home of the brave, Kanye and Jackson. Thank you, Warriors, Coney Allen. God's Green Plus Rainco, Edmund Juicy, in pursuit of happiness. Here's a piece of cantaloupe, cantaloupe from Earth to God's Green Earth. Mm. I used to pick this though. Look, so that one. <laughs> 